Welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility, an ongoing inquiry into American political origins and evolving institutions. The Executive Director of the Virtual Center is Dr. Bill O'Brien. He's also your host for this continuing conversation. Here he is now, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Thank you, Bob Kincaid, and welcome to this, the Wednesday edition of the Virtual Center for the Study of the U.S. Constitution and Civic Responsibility. It is Wednesday. It is the 17th day of uh, December. I drew a blank there for a moment. It is the 17th day of December, and it is a pleasure to be with you today here on the Virtual Center. Um, I, I want to uh, give you the uh, f make sure you have the phone number and the email address and all of that, all of that housekeeping stuff right, right up front because we would love to hear from you. Um, our phone number is area code 304-663-4676. That's 304-663-HORN, H-O-R-N. My email address, waobrien906 at gmail.com. That's waobrien906 at gmail.com. It is a pleasure to be with you on this a Wednesday. We are within a week now of the coming of uh, uh, of, of Christmas. Will be a week. Will be a week tomorrow. Uh, will be Christmas Day, and um, it appears that uh, the, the schedule that we will be following here at the Virtual Center is that we will be doing a program on Monday. Uh, this coming Monday, which will be the 21st, I believe, of of December. Um, but we will not be doing a program on Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. I will be, I'll be in the car traveling, uh, driving to New England uh, for Christmas uh, with grandchildren, and uh, we'll be leaving early on Tuesday morning. So we will be doing a Monday program at the Virtual Center, but not Tuesday and Wednesday next week. However, the week after that, which will be New Year's week, at this point we're talking about um, uh, doing, uh, doing our regular schedule of programs on Monday and Tuesday, and we'll, I guess we'll have to decide about Christmas Eve, Wednesday. The, the thought of doing a program on the day before New, you know, on New Year's Eve is kind of interesting. So, um, uh, but anyway, we know that we'll be doing a program on Monday and Tuesday of New, Year, New Year's week. So, so again, after our program today here at the Virtual Center, we will uh, be back on Monday, but then we will not be back until the following Monday after, after that. Um, I wanted to uh, begin the program by, by just kind of rehashing very, very quickly um, uh, a little bit about the program we did yesterday on the preamble to the Constitution. Uh, it, it, it was an idea. It was something that I thought would probably only take maybe 30 minutes at the most. And, and uh, if you were with us yesterday, you know that we we spent pretty much the bulk of the hour and a half that we were together yesterday at the Virtual Center on the preamble. It's very, very meaningful. Um, there's a lot of meaning. Uh, I, I was going to say hidden meaning. It's not necessarily hidden. It's implied. But a lot of it requires, uh, you know, some familiarity with 18th century thinking and philosophy and 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 uh, the ideas associated with Republican government and uh, consent of the governed and many of these other things that that went into the. Uh, the forming of the of the American Republic with with independence. So, uh, I'm hoping that uh, that the program was informative. The one message that I think comes through, however, is that if you look at the very specific outcomes or objectives for the Constitution, as as outlined or defined in the preamble to the Constitution, it's very clear that the idea of a vigorous Government, an active, vigorous government, is implied in accomplishing all of these things because, by definition, none of them happen in and of themselves. They all require some sort of initiative, some sort of planning, some sort of activity on on the part of government. And the final outcome to the preamble, which is to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity theoretically would be the result of the successful achievement of the other outcomes 
which would be a step which would be to establish justice ensure domestic tranquility provide for the common defense promote the general welfare and you know, uh, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity so the implications of the blessings of liberty would be contingent if you will on the achievement the active pursuit of these other objectives which will be a the the pursuit of a just society um, the promotion of the idea of the general welfare um, in, in other words governing on behalf of all of the people not just some of the people uh, not just the few not just the property owners not just whites but the but you know in theory at least the public interest requires that government operate to the best interests of everyone in society and under the rule of law at least from the perspective of equality under the rule of law in theory at least republican government gets its marching orders if you will from the will of the people consequently the introduction we the people to the preamble uh, I think it's a very very interesting paragraph um, many people I know many when I was a, in grade school we had to memorize the preamble uh, I'm not really sure that we really understood what it meant but it's kind of like the Pledge of Allegiance I don't think pe many people have thought too carefully about what the uh, what the what the words to that particular uh, uh, exercise mean either but again if you if you do have ideas or reactions or you would like to uh, make a, a contribution to our understanding or discussion of the preamble to the Constitution by all means we would love to hear from you again our our phone number is area code 304 663 4676 that's 304 663 horn h-o-r-n on your on your keypad um, and again, my email address very quickly, waobrien, I-E-N, 906, at gmail.com. One of the issues that came up in the course of yesterday's program as we were considering the idea of the general welfare was the idea of the free market, and specifically mention of Adam Smith and Adam Smith's very famous Wealth of Nations which is kind of the the creed, if you will, of 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 the free market, uh, published in 1776, uh, of course, the very same year for of American independence. But one of the things that becomes very very clear about Adam Smith and the wealth of nations is the extent to which our interpretations of the wealth of nations of Adam Smith have been skewed dramatically I think one of the things that becomes very very clear and we've been on this before and I don't necessarily want to take the entire program uh, uh, today's program on the idea of the market but I'll be very honest with you where I want to go uh, for the bulk of today's program is into the issue of slavery and the extent to which slavery and capitalism are not as is often uh, portrayed or assumed to be antithetical to each other I know all the years that I've been teaching I taught them that way we'll get into this later in our in our program today but the fact of the matter is while there are antagonisms and and contradictions between the idea of slavery and the idea of capitalism the fact of the matter is that they are not necessarily 100 percent contradictory to each other at all and some of the latest literature that is being produced on capitalism on the study of capitalism itself is beginning to recognize the extent to which capitalist development itself in the modern world depended upon and and rely, relied almost exclusively for a while on slavery and so whereas slavery is generally portrayed as antithetical 
to capitalism. The fact of the matter is the slave system fed the growth and expansion of capitalism in ways that perhaps no other form of organizing labor could do. So I, I, I wanted to uh, spend some time on today's program uh, looking at this and looking at some of the literature um, associated is the, the, some of the literature that's coming out on this topic which is which is is becoming a very very hot issue uh, there's an awful lot of material coming out not only on capitalism but also on the relationship between slavery and capitalism's development um, but before we did that uh, do that I, I really wanted to begin our program today by looking a little bit more critically at Adam Smith and the ideas put forth in the Wealth of Nations, the idea of the so-called free market. And the reason that I think it warrants attention is because what we begin to recognize is that more often than not, we end up violating the very philosophy that Adam Smith articulated in the Wealth of Nations. In other words, the biggest advocates, the most outspoken advocates for Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, and the idea of the free market, and the idea of keeping government out of the economy, which Adam Smith argued vociferously about, has led us to believe that the advocates of market freedom today are really devotees, are acolytes, are followers of Adam Smith, when in fact many of the ideas that they practice and espouse are ideas which which did not fit into Adam Smith's frame of reference at all. The one we talked about yesterday was the emergence within the free market of monopolies, the issue of power. And even more more to the point, the issue of class and its association to power. It stands to reason, this is the pure theory, it stands to reason that in a an ideal competitive situation where the competitors are relatively equal, where no competitor has has substantially more power than any others than any other adam smith's idea is that the 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 beauty of the market of the free market the beauty of capitalism is that when you have relatively equal participants competitors competing for business and competing for their own self interest in a in a free market in an unregulated market some stupendous exciting things happen and that is that the market seems automatically to take care of the entire society if you will it provides jobs. It satisfies demand for goods and services. It provides an income. It provides profit for the owners of capital, which can, in a sense, reinvest in expansion. And Adam Smith called all of this the idea of the visible, hand, the invisible hand. It's almost like some force that we don't understand is making sure that the market is taken care of, that demand is satisfied, that supply is adequate, that income is relatively fairly distributed between owners and workers. That's the ideal. And of course the outcomes of the ideal are, inc are incredibly positive. That's the theory that the outspoken advocates of the free market talk about all the time. However, the reality is 
that the practices that are often followed in so-called free enterprise capitalism are not the practices advocated by Adam Smith. It stands to reason that in any kind of a competitive situation, there is going to be there are going to be winners and there are going to be losers. If you have an expanding, growing market, then that means that there is opportunity for the losers to dust themselves off and begin again. That's the beauty of capitalism, is the, ex the experience or the growth, if you will, of opportunity. It's the availability of opportunities, the growing availability of opportunities that allow capitalism to work. If losing the competition was to be fatal, in other words, if this was a competition that nobody could afford to lose, then it would be ruthless. But the idea is that as long as the economy is expanding and as long as new opportunities are being generated, then losing becomes a, a short-term setback rather than a long-term result. But here's the reality that creates the problem. In any kind of, of competitive situation with winners and losers, by definition, the winners are going to emerge stronger as a result of the victory than they began the competition. It stands to reason. So the result is that the distribution of power within the ideal free market is constantly in flux because power seems to be gravitating towards the winners. And so consequently, the winner of a particular comp competition becomes that much stronger for the competition in the next competitive situation. The result is that some people become more and more powerful all the time. A logical outcome of the free market, the competition of the free market, is monopoly, is power. And the other outcome of the free market competition is the emergence of class and the potential destruction of all, set, all elements, all s statements, if you will, associated with equality. In this struggle, monopoly is a logical outcome. Monopoly was anathema to Adam Smith. Adam Smith believed that management of the op of the market required that monopolies be discouraged that monopolies be broken up because the process can't work without them because by definition monopolies inhibit competition not only that but monopolies bring or are associated with the acquisition of power and this is where we get into the issue of government it's it's to Adam Smith very very logical that monopolies by definition would become centers of power and therefore they would have an undue influence with government and they would be able to get their way with government so that government's regulation and management of the market would be skewed in their favor. And the result would be the destruction of the free market. And what you would have then is what we have today, which is not so much a market economy as it is a command economy 
where the commands, the power, is being exercised principally by huge monopolies, by huge corporate monopolies who dictate supply, who control or manipulate demand. And more importantly, which outsource price, cost. According to Adam Smith's theory in The Wealth of Nations, pricing of goods and services has to include cost of production. In other words, by definition, the seller has to make sure that the price he sets on the product or the service is adequate to cover the costs of production. But it seems that associated with monopoly is the ability to outsource costs, to unload cost on somebody else. Oftentimes the taxpayer. So for example, if you have enough influence and enough power with government, then you can that you can arrange for incredibly profitable deals where the cost of your enterprise is being absorbed by taxpayers. Let me give you an example. Waste, toxic waste. If you can dump waste and do not have to cover the cost of treating waste and eliminating waste in such a way that it will be safe for the community at large, for the society at large. If you can get away with just dumping it and then asking the taxpayers to pick up the cost of cleaning up the environment and, and dealing with the, uh, with the waste and polluted air and all the other things that are associated with production and you don't have to include them in the cost, then ultimately that gives you access to inordinate unearned profit. And it's the ability, the power that's associated with monopoly that permits this kind of access to government which creates circumstances which allow major producers to outsource cost. According to Adam Smith, the idea is cost needs to be built into the price. That's part of the cost of doing business. But if you can eliminate your costs by getting other people to pick up these extrinsic costs, and you don't have to take care of them, then that gives you a tremendous advantage. Of course, what it also does is it destroys anything that we would associate with the term free market, because it's pretty obvious that the market is no longer free. If certain players, certain producers, are able to go into the competition with this kind, with these kinds of advantages, then the theory of the free market is really just that, a theory. It's a myth. It's a dream. So again, the very people that advocate for Adam Smith's unregulated market the loudest are most likely the people who are engaged in activities which are destroying that very market, which are destroying that very theory. And so what we end up with, of course, is people speaking out of both sides of their mouths at the same, at the same time. And it becomes very difficult, and I'm thinking from the perspective of 
kids, of youngsters, of students, it becomes very difficult to understand, to really understand free market capitalism, for example, when the story being told is not pure. That certain elements of the story are being left out. For example, the issue of class. Adam Smith was very aware of the issue of class. Let me, uh, let me take a moment to share with you a source. In, 95, in 1995, David Corton, K-O-R-T-E-N, published a book entitled, When Corporations Rule the World. And in that book, he includes a section on what he calls the betrayal of Adam Smith. And he's talking about the differences between the theories of Adam Smith's and the realities of global capitalism in today's today's world. Here's a quote from Adam Smith about government. Adam Smith was very suspicious about government because Adam Smith believed that government's principal jobs was to ended up being at to be at the bidding of monopolies, of those with the most power. And that governments oftentimes would use their taxing power in order to shift costs from the producers to the public at large, which is indeed exactly what, what happens. Here's Adam Smith's statement on on government. Civil government, so far as it is instituted for the security of property, is in reality instituted for the defense of the rich against the poor, or of those who have some property against those who have none at all, unquote. So he's very, very suspicious of government because all government can do to the theories of the free market as outlined in the wealth of nations is to cause problems by skewing the market in such a way that it is no longer competitive. And Adam Smith's idea, of course, is that as much as possible, the market must be kept, must be managed in order to remain competitive. That's the only way that the best interests of society, i.e. the public interest, which is how this came up yesterday, the public interest would be would be addressed. One of the key issues, of course, is this issue of cost. Adam Smith argued that cost needed to be internalized. It needed to be incorporated in the pricing of goods and services. By definition, producers producers were expected to bear the cost of production. And in Adam Smith's mind, it would be unconscionable for producers to hand off the cost of production to somebody else. But in effect, with the collusion with government, that's what, in effect, more often than not, has happened. And the result is that the that the the goals, if you will, the ideals of the market cannot be realized in in this kind in this kind of an environment. Um, this is this is the place where Adam Smith mentions the so-called invisible hand. And he says, by preferring the support of domestic to that of foreign industry, and I'll I'll get to this in a moment, by preferring the support of domestic to that of foreign industry, he intends only his own security. And by directing that industry in such a manner as its produce may be of the greatest value, he intends only his own gain. And he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand, to promote an end which was no part of his intention. In other words, self-interested individuals pursuing their own self-interest result in the public good. That's the theory. 
result in the general welfare. But what Smith's argument is, is in order for that to happen, capital must be invented, invested locally, not globally, not worldwide. I'm, I'm quoting David Corden here. A third condition basic to the market theories of Adam Smith, Corton says, but rarely noted by corporate libertarians, is that capital is locally or nationally rooted, and its owners are directly involved in its management. Adam Smith made quite explicit in his Wealth of Nations his assumption that capital would be rooted in place in the locality where its owner lived. He made it clear that this condition is critical to enabling the invisible hand of the market to translate the pursuit of self-interest into optimal public benefit. And then he, and then Corton follows with the quote that I just read you about the invisible hand. So the idea of investing in global production was anathema to Smith because he believed that investments needed to be managed by the owner. The person that owned them and invested them needed to be managed, needed to manage them. And it was only in that way that the ideal goals, outcomes of the market could be achieved. So when Adam Smith is talking about the benefits of the free market economy in terms of supply and demand and the fairness of price and, and, and all the rest of it, he's talking about small competitors, small producers competing with each other on a relatively equal basis. What has happened, of course is that monopoly and power have entered into this equation to the point that they have disrupted the realities of the theory. But politically, it's good business for these people to continue to articulate their commitment to the theories of Adam Smith, even though they are not living them. And the only way that they can get away from the, with this the only way that they can pull this off is if people don't understand the theories of the market. In other words, our education system is really a miseducation system because in reality it is being skewed to the benefit of those with the most to gain and those with the most power and influence. This particular section of David Corden's book ends with an issue that I would like to share with you also. And this is the issue of power and class as being integral parts of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. David Corden cites an economist at Tufts University in Massachusetts whose name is Neva Goodwin. N-E-V-A, Neva Goodwin. Neva Goodwin heads the Global Development and Environmental Institute at Tufts University. And in her work, she makes the point that what she calls the neoclassical school of economics, where most of the advocates of Adam Smith's free market reside, end up promoting what she calls the political economy of Adam Smith minus the political analysis of Karl Marx. This is complicated and I'm going to rely pretty much on Neva Goodman's analysis here in order to, to make this clear. Basically what she's saying is that we really only get half the story because these people are shrewd enough to leave out the parts that don't fit what the story that they want to tell. 
So she claims that these advocates of the free market, advocates of what she calls corporate libertarianism, are characterized principally by the political economy of Adam Smith minus the political analysis of Karl Marx. This is a quote from Neva Goodwin. Neva Goodwin. The classical political economy of Adam Smith was a much broader, more humane subject than the economics that's taught in our universities today. Basically what she's saying is we are tampering with the, pro the purity of the product. We are teaching Adam Smith in our universities, in our economics courses in universities, but we are teaching a tainted, incomplete, skewed version of Adam Smith. And we are turning out acolytes, believers, who believe in the theory that they've been taught but really don't understand the realities of the world that they are operating in. The classical political economy of Adam Smith, she says, was a much broader, much more humane subject than the economics that is taught in our universities today. For at least a century, it has been virtually taboo to talk about economic power in the capitalist context. When we hear economists talk about capitalism, they rarely talk about power. Because the ideal of Adam Smith is competition among small producers that are relatively equal in power. Think of the NFL. Think of, of Football Sunday. Think of the extent to which we claim that we want to see really competitive games. But the fact of the matter is, for the team that we support, we don't want a good game at all. We want a slaughter. I'm, a guilty, I'm guilty as, as guilty of this as anybody else. I'm a big New England Patriots fan. In fact, I take the New England Patriots so seriously that if I think they've got a good chance to lose, I don't watch because I don't know if I can handle the stress of a really competitive game where they are depending on Tom Brady with seconds left and no timeouts at the end of the game to go to the length, go to the length of the field in order to win a, a one-point victory or something like that. Um, I used to love those. But as I've gotten older, I find them more and more stressful. I'm much more comfortable when the Patriots are up 35 to nothing at halftime. Then I can sit back and enjoy pro football. I don't think I'm out of the ordinary. I don't think I'm unique. Everybody talks about how the teams are evenly matched and... and and, and it's going to be a good game and all that. But the fact of the matter is, if you have a druther, if you support one team or the other, one side or the other in the competition, you are not looking for an even, fair, competitive match. You are hoping for a slaughter. In a sense, then, what we are doing is talking out of both sides of our mouth at the same time. We claim commitment to competition but we really don't live it. We talk it, but we don't walk it. And what Neva Goodman, Goodwin is saying is that seems to be what we do when we teach economics in our universities today. We are teaching those aspects of Adam Smith which fit our worldview, but we are very, very shrewdly eliminating from Adam Smith the things that don't. And what she's talking about is the purity of Adam Smith's theories as articulated in The Wealth of Nations versus the way we teach them. I think here at the Virtual Center, one of the things that I've seen 
in the many months that we've been doing these programs at the Virtual Center is the extent to which political scientists and historians are guilty of the same thing as our economists. Namely, we have skewed the founders in the particular directions that we want the founders to go in. We have almost become advocates in some cases of not what the founders wrote, but more specifically what the founders should have wrote written if they had known better. If they knew what we wanted, they would have written this. In other words, we're putting words in the mouth of the founders in order that the system they designed will better fit the system that we want in today's world. And Neva Goodwin is saying that's exactly what's happening in the way that Adam Smith is being taught in our universities. And of course the taboo that she mentions here is the taboo of communism, Marxism. We absolutely have not found a way to deal constructively with Marx within a capitalist framework. What we have chosen to do instead is exclude Marx as if Marx never existed. As if his theories of class never existed. We are, in effect, trying to implement the world we wish we had because we're uncomfortable with the world that we do have. Bob and I were talking just before we went on the air today about the news coming out of Washington related to to Cuba and President Obama's initiative to begin to break down the, the, the walls, if you will, which have isolated Cuba. And if you think about this, I mean, this kind of fits into what we're talking about here, because the way we have chosen to deal with communist Cuba from the 1950s on is to isolate it and try to pretend that it's not there and put pressure in our allies to do the same thing. In other words, the way you deal with a problem is to force people to not acknowledge the existence of the problem. If you think of the way we conducted our foreign policy during the Cold War, non-recognition, in other words, refusing to recognize the existence of China because China was mainland China was communist. And instead, claiming that the little island under Chiang Kai-shek was really China, and that the vast mainland population of tens and hundreds of millions of people did not exist. It is not real politics, it's absurd politics. It's an effort to impose a world that we want rather than dealing the one with the one that we have. In terms of the founders, putting words into the, into the mouths of the founders in order to turn them into advocates for things that we advocate, whether in fact they advocated them or not. How are we going to educate our young people when we are afraid to tell our young people the truth about the economy, about international affairs, about free enterprise, about the founders, about the Constitution, about what motivated the drafters of the Constitution, about the bill, I mean, the realities, that the, the historical realities that we dealt with. We continue to turn out young people who believe that the Constitution of the United States is all about rights. 
my rights to religious freedom and my rights to free press and my rights to, to freedom of assembly. When in fact the Bill of Rights was not even part of the Constitution when it was first drafted. We don't teach that. We continue to perpetrate, perpetrate this delusion that the founders got together in Philadelphia to construct a document to protect people's rights and freedoms. And then we worry because the results of our educational enterprise are not up to par. The scores are dropping. The standardized test scores are dropping in math and reading and all the rest of it. So we're operating from multiple playbooks here. And it seems to me that our, our chances of, of really beginning to accomplish things in our educational system is going to require, first and foremost, that we get our ducks in order and decide exactly what we want our education system to do. Whether it's educate, whether it's persuade, whether it's indoctrinate, whether it's to enliven minds or to dull them. I think all of these are important, important issues. Back to Neva Goodwin and back to her quote about Adam Smith. For at least a century, she says, it has been virtually taboo to talk about economic power in the capitalist context. That was a communist idea. That was Marxism. The concept of class was similarly banned from discussion. And this is David Corton's analysis of what Neva Goodman is saying, Goodwin is saying. Adam Smith was as acutely aware of issues of power and class as he was of the dynamics of competitive markets. Adam Smith did not only talk about and know about competitive markets. He was aware of the issues of power and he was aware of the issues of class. We choose to eliminate the issues of power from the equation because we're trying to perpetrate this idea that everybody's equal and that the competition is fair when in reality everybody realizes that it's not. That's the first thing. And the second thing is we try to deny that there is such a thing as class associated with free market capitalism. Because class is a term that is associated with Karl Marx. And the way we deal with Karl Marx is to not deal with Karl Marx. Consequently, this is David Corton's conclusion on this. Adam Smith was as acutely aware of the issues of power and class as he was of the dynamics of competitive markets. However, the classical economists and the neo-Marxist economists bifurcated his holistic perspective on the political economy, one taking those portions of the analysis that favored the owners of property the other that favored those who sell their labor. Those economists that we would call class, neoclassical economists, advocates of Adam Smith, have chosen to skew their arguments on behalf of the propertied and to ignore the other side. to ignore the issues of class which are, which are a logical product of this. On the other hand, those economists that we call neo-Marxist, those economists that we would classify as leftist economists, they tend to emphasize workers, the working class, and de-emphasize the benefits and the positives of the market.
and David Corton's analysis is as follows. Thus, the neoclassical economists left out Adam Smith's considerations of the destructive role of power and class. The neo-Marxists left out the beneficial functions of the market. So depending on who you get, <coughs> depending on whose textbook you read, you're either going to get a skewed presentation in the direction of the working class, or you're going to get a skewed presentation in the direction of the rights of the property. But you're not going to get be able to get the interactions of both. In order to do that, we've got to go back to the sources. We've got to do what we've been doing here at the Virtual Center for going on two years. And that is look at the sources and let the sources tell us what the people who produced them really thought, really believed, and really wanted. Rather than get textbooks interpretations of these, where the agenda of the author supersedes the realities of the sources. I really believe that this is incredibly important. Because for a long time, until I began to actually deal with Adam Smith as Adam Smith, I, be I was one of those people that only knew about Adam Smith what people told me, what teachers in class told me, what textbooks told me. But in effect, if they are economists, they've gone through an economics orientation which either leans left or leans right. Which means that in both cases, the principal goal has been to indoctrinate them as students, not educate them as potential instructors. I think we see, we've seen it with the founders. We've seen it with political documents. And here we're seeing it in the way we teach economics. We've got about five minutes left in this our first hour. So I'd like to I'd like to maybe begin to bring this to a logical conclusion by sharing with you David Corden's conclusion on this section he entitles The Betrayal of Adam Smith as part of his larger study which is entitled When Corporations Rule the World. This section is in this paragraph is entitled In Praise of Competitive Markets. And this is what David Corden said. I was going to paraphrase this and I finally after reading it about three times I took my red pen and I put large quotation marks at the beginning at the end of this paragraph with the idea when it comes time to to address what's in this paragraph we need to do it honestly completely by reading the actual document itself so here is David Corton's conclusion here about this issue of markets and what he for what he calls the betrayal of Adam Smith when the necessary conditions are met the market is a powerful and efficient mechanism for allocating resources what we now have is not a market economy it is increasingly a command economy centrally planned and managed by the world's largest corporations to maximize financial returns to top managers and the wealthiest shareholders at the expense of the rest of society. Now that is a powerful, powerful sentence. We don't have a market economy. We have a command economy centrally planned and managed by the world's largest corporations to maximize financial returns to top managers and the wealthiest shareholders 
at the expense of the rest of society. They are mouthing Adam Smith, they are mouthing neoclassical economics, but they are living the realities portrayed by Karl Marx. If the corporate libertarians were to bear serious allegiance to market principles and human rights, in other words, if these people who claim commitment to Adam Smith were really true to what they are saying, if they decided to walk the walk rather than merely talk the talk, David Corden said, they would be calling for policies aimed at achieving the conditions in which markets function in a democratic fashion in the public interest. They would be calling for measures to end subsidies and preferential treatment for large corporations, to break up corporate monopolies, encourage the distribution of property ownership, internalize social and environmental costs, root capital in place, secure the rights of workers to the just fruits of their labor, and limit opportunities to, ex to obtain extravagant individual incomes far greater than their productive competition. Unquote. If these people were true to what they preach, then they would be enacting and supporting policies which were intended to actually create something resembling the ideals of the market competition that Adam Smith wrote about. And if they did that, then they could legitimately claim that the market economy they are so committed to really is in the public interest rather than in the interests of the few at the, ex at the expense of the many which seems to be the reality of the world that we are living in today I think that this is incredibly important obviously the way the economy of the nation works, the way that business corpor corporate relationships with government operate in today's world is obviously a key part of what an organization entitled the Virtual Center for the Study of the U.S. Constitution and Civic Responsibility would be about. Because the Constitution of the United States lays out and defines the ingredients of Republican government, then the civic responsibility of citizens is critical. If Republican government is going to live up to the theories of Republican government, then we are talking about the necessity of an educated, involved electorate rather than a command economy dictated by the wealth and influence of the few. Until we begin to move in that direction, we will continue to be talking out of different sides of our mouth at the same time. It stands to reason, for example, that in 1776, in the 18th century, when Adam Smith wrote, we had not at that time ever reached the point where theoretically active vigorous government could become critical to the creation and the promotion of liberty rather than government being anathema to individual liberty. That was the ongoing view at the time but as a result of the development of global capitalism government's role had to change accordingly and the history of the American history throughout is really the struggle of trying to arrive at the optimum role for government within this within this framework 
it's very obvious today, for example, with the Cuban situation going on in Washington this very day. It's very obviously with the administrative decisions that President Obama is making prior to the time that the new Republican Congress comes in in January. The fact that government, the, that the president seems to feel that he must act without Congress because he can't do business with Congress seems to me to indicate that we really have, as, as yet, we really have not successfully addressed all these problems. We have not defined the proper role for government within our modern economic world. And it seems to me that we're paying the price for it. We are at 2 p.m. Uh, in the East. We have reached the end of our first hour. I'd like to pause and take a five-minute break and then come back and do and, and pursue this a little bit, talk about the issue of capitalism, but more specifically the role of slavery in capitalism's development. Uh, I'm going to give due credit where credit is due uh, to the review, uh, this incredibly informative review that I was fortunate enough to lay my hands on in the Chronicle of Higher Education recently. I think you'll find it informative and I hope beneficial. But first, let's pause and take a very short break. You are listening to the Virtual Center for the Study of the U.S. Constitution and Civic Responsibility. I hope that you'll stay with us after a five-minute break. We'll be right back. Thank you. Bob Kincaid, and welcome back to the second hour of this uh, edition of the Virtual Center for the Study of the U.S. Constitution and Civic Responsibility. It is a Wednesday. Today is the 17th day of December. Uh, we are map rapidly moving towards Christmas, obviously, and our, our scheduling will will clearly be be affected by that. I think as everybody's life is affected by the by the season that we are in. Um, welcome. If you are just joining us, we welcome you to the Virtual Center. If you have been with us through the first hour uh, and you put up with a rather labor labored effort to deal with the realities as opposed to the popular versions, if you will, of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, then I, I welcome you to to today's program. If you've if you've been th with us through that first hour and you're still with us. More power to you, <laughs> and and I appreciate it very very much. Uh, if you are just joining us, welcome. Uh, I, we do encourage you to participate in our in our program. Uh, I, I about halfway through the last hour, uh, in the midst of this effort to try to uh, get my arms around the theories of the market, the the, the ideas of Adam Smith, it began to, it began to dawn on me. Um, if I were out there in the listening audience listening to this, how would I respond? How would I participate? What would I say? If I did pick up the phone and dial the number, what would I, what would I have to say? And I, I apologize for that because I, I, you know, I understand that. But at the same time, I think the conclusions of that story are are significant the fact that that we are not wrestling with an effort to really understand adam smith that more often than not we're wrestling with the efforts of those to twist adam smith into something that rationalizes contemporary behavior i think we've pretty much said the same thing in dealing with the founders over the previous months as we struggle with what those who wish to take the founders and turn them into advocates of particular political agendas at, at, a, at, at this point in time seek to enlist the founders in their, in their cause, in their campaign becomes very very difficult to deal realistically with the founders 
when you are get, not getting an accurate but rather a rather skewed version of what the founders were about in whatever aspect of the story you happen to be focusing on. I find it a little bit disturbing to recognize that the same thing is true in economics because I was one of those people that believed that economic that economics was 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 much more definitive, much more quantitative, much more fixed, much less susceptible to interpretation and invention, if you will, than it turns out that it has been. At the same time, I've realized over the years that we really have not been able to come to grips successfully with Karl Marx. We've tried, but basically we've done the same thing to Karl Marx philosophically and economically that we tried to do with China globally and politically, and that is isolate them and pretend that they do not, that, that it doesn't exist. In other words, the way you deal with the problem is close your eyes and cross your fingers in hopes that when you uncross your fingers and open your eyes, the problem will be gone. I find that particularly frightening. We look forward to hearing from you. Our listeners do. They would, I know, appreciate hearing a voice different, different than, than mine on occasion. Um, our phone number is area code 304-663-4676. That's 304-663-HORN, H-O-R-N. If you'd like to communicate with me via email, I would I would really appreciate hearing from you. My email address is waobrian906 at gmail.com. waobrian, B-R-I-E-N, 906 at gmail.com. At the outset of today's program, one hour ago, I mentioned that our second hour would focus also on this economic story, but it would particularly focus <coughs> excuse me, coughing moment there for a second. It would particularly focus on the relationship or the connection between slavery and the development, the historical development of, of capitalism in the modern world. And I'd like to do that, and I want to make sure that I give credit, because this, this stuff is not my own. And I don't ever want anybody to assume that, that I'm putting forth all of this stuff and that I know it. I don't. I'm reading, um, and that's one of the things that I so appreciate about the Virtual Center is the fact that it has kept me, it has kept me reading at a time in my life when, when a lot of people stop reading. And I, I, I feel blessed because of this opportunity and I, I, I want want you to appreciate that and want you to know it. Earlier this month, about a week week ago, on the on the twelve well, about six days ago, on the twelfth of December, in the Chronicle of Higher Education, there was an article. I look at the Chronicle every day, the Chronicle of Higher Education. But since I've retired from teaching full time I, I tend to be looking for different things now than I did then. I used to look for ideas and, and innovations in classroom instruction, especially in, at the college level. Today, because my, my, the extent of my intellectual activity is pretty much tied up with the virtual center, then I'm looking for ideas and issues that it would seem to me would benefit those who are kind enough to tune in on a regular basis to the virtual center. And on the 12th of December, I was fortunate to come across just such a piece. And I want to share it with you because it, it caught my fancy because I have been quite aware for some time that historians have begun over the last couple of years at least to revisit the issue of American slavery 
and more importantly to look at slavery and its role in America's development in new and creative ways in an effort to try to reach a real appreciation for the extent to which whatever accomplishments this nation has achieved are due in larger part than any of us ever knew or believed before on the backs of slaves. I've been aware of this for, for, for some time and I find it a little bit exciting that over the last couple of years there has been a flood of literature, a flood of studies looking at the issue of slavery in new and creative, I think, and in very insightful ways. And this particular piece is an effort of the author to try to pull all of this together and make some sense out of it. And I thought that it was a very successful effort. The author of this article is, is one Sven Beckert. First name Sven, S-V-E-N. Last name Beckert, B-E-C-K-E-R-T. Sven Beckert is a professor of American history at Harvard. And he has just published a book published by Alfred, Alfred A. Knopf entitled Empire of Cotton, A Global History. And this article is pretty much a synopsis and a synthesis not only of his book but of the circumstances which caused him to write the book in the first place. I think in, in what turns out to be four or five pages of text he has done a phenomenal job in making us, making the readers, me, aware of the significance of these issues and the reason why so many people from so many different directions are engaged in revisiting the emergence of and especially the height of of the slave plantation system in the in North America in the United States in the 19th century prior to the prior to the Civil War not only has slavery begun to get a lot of attention but so also has capitalism itself as the world becomes more and more connected technologically through the internet cell phones and all the rest of it as we begin to look at the economies from a global perspective more and more people are beginning to reassess and reevaluate at least revisit the concept of capitalism itself and it stands to reason that eventually these two poles would come together namely the focus on slavery on the one hand as opposed to the issue of capitalism on the other. And before getting into some of Sven Beckert's analysis, I just wanted to kind of share with you the, the more traditional analysis of how slavery and capitalism have traditionally connected or not connected, as the case may be. For years, I've been teaching the degree to which slavery is antithetical, hostile to the ideas and the theories driving capitalism. Over the years, I've, I've pretty much, I think, developed this thesis to the point that I, I really believe I do a pretty good job with it in class. And the reason I say that is because it usually gets us 
into issues and areas that students have never had before. This is usually, you know, to, to, to not to make fun of it, but in a sense, this particular issue tends to be news to a lot of students because most students have never looked at slavery and capitalism in the same, you know, in, in the same venue in the, as being in any way related or connected at all. My job, obviously, as a person teaching American history, my job has principally focused around, of, around trying to explain the origins of the Civil War. To what extent, when Lincoln made the famous statement that we cannot continue to exist half slave and half free, we must be all one or all the other, or when his secretary, uh, foreign secretary, William Seward, published the very famous irrepressible conflict, Seward's explanation, uh, explanation that the North and the South in 18th century America was so antithetical to each other was so different that conflict was inevitable between the slave system and capitalism. Obviously the assumption here then is that capitalism and slavery are opposites. And if you get into the theories, the realities of what we call free labor capitalism, it makes sense. And this is the way that I have always chosen to present it. The whole idea of free enterprise capitalism is based on opportunity, access to opportunity. The, the idea, and we talked about this in our first hour, the idea of an expanding, growing economy, and with it, the expansion of economic opportunity. There's no question that the association of empire with capitalism, which goes back to Karl Marx, is based on the idea that capitalism must continually expand, must continually grow in order to provide the kind of opportunities that the free labor system demands. Because as opportunities are expanding, as new opportunities are emerging, it provides an environment where free people, people can exercise their individual liberty to pursue the opportunity most available to them. If these opportunities didn't exist, if there were not opportunities continually being created, if people's potential to become successful, people's willingness to accept defeat, competitive defeat, with the idea that you can pick up and begin again, you can move. If you're not making it in this town, move. Move west, the old idea, go west, young man, go west. The whole idea of expansive capitalism and the expansion of opportunity helps us understand and explain the whole idea of America's stability and the fact that America has never experienced the kind of internal insurrection and, and revolution that we associate with the Russian Revolution, with the French Revolution, etc. We had a war for independence, 
it's debatable whether that constituted a revolution or not. And the reason that we've been able to avoid that kind of internal civil war, that kind of total disruption of society, is because we have been blessed in this country with seemingly endless opportunity in the acquisition of land, the expansion across the continent. And as of 1900, when the United States began to successfully flex its muscles internationally and we became a global power as a result of World War I, then in effect the influence of America's industrial might with the Industrial Revolution meant that these opportunities could continue to expand and continue to grow even though the arena was no longer restricted to the continental United States but rather became worldwide in terms of access to worldwide sources of raw materials and international markets and it's the expansion of capitalism the growth and the provision of seemingly endless opportunities that has guaranteed that freedom in the West really has meaning. And this really helps us understand the nature of free labor. The idea of free labor is the based on the idea that people are free to seek the best price for their labor, to sell their labor, as it were, at the best available price by quitting this job and moving to that job, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in fact, if you think about it, recently in the at the end of the 20th century, the whole idea, beginning with the Tax Reform Act of 86 of 1986 in Congress, the whole idea of the movement away from pensions and toward IRAs was based on the idea that an IRA meant that you owned your own retirement plan. It was not directly tied or controlled by your employer, which meant that if you moved, if you lost your job or changed jobs, you brought your IRA, your IRA with you. Your retirement in funds became your own property. And so therefore, that created the freedom to move, to change jobs, to change the locations. People didn't feel that they were stuck in a particular employment situation because they couldn't afford to risk the loss of their pensions. This was the, the major PR system that was responsible for the conversion of America's retirement priorities from pensions to IRAs. And we, that's another program. We'll get into that. But this is the whole idea of opportunity. This is what makes freedom meaningful. Without expanding opportunities, freedom would prove meaningless. Freedom to do what? If the free if freedom the freedom we have is not the freedom to pursue new opportunities, new horizons, then why even care about the whole idea of individual freedom and that's the basis of the free labor system all right going back into the 19th century within the United States by definition the free labor system required growing opportunities and at that time that meant land that meant the Louisiana Purchase. That meant the land taken from Mexico in the middle of the 19th century in the Mexican War. The so-called Mexican Cession. It meant the admission of California and Oregon into the Union as free states. And as key parts of the Compromise of 1850. By definition then, 
the the real issue behind the Civil War, the incompatibility between the North and the South, if you will, is based on the incompatibility of the free labor system with the slave labor system. There's no way that free labor can flourish if slavery is in the neighborhood. If I'm a slave owner and I own my labor, then there's no way that you can compete with that. There's no way that you can compete with my labor, with my slaves. The only way that you can realize success for yourself is to go somewhere where slavery isn't. And what we've been talking about throughout 19th century American history is the issue of the expansion of slavery into the territories. The extent to which the West would welcome slavery or ban slavery. And the reality is that every territory that permitted slavery became a territory that free labor immigration did not go to it. Every state, every territory that allowed slavery effectively killed the expansion of free labor, the expansion of opportunity in the process. Consequently, the real struggle between North and South, the political struggle as it occurred in Congress, was the struggle over the admission of new states and expansion. Because the only way that the what was becoming at that time the Industrial Revolution could operate was that it needed to expand into areas that did not welcome slavery. But here's the kicker. The slave system itself is a form of, of capitalism. It's a business. Managing a plantation, despite the literature suggesting otherwise, is an enterprise. It's a business. Successful slave owners, plantation owners, needed to be able to, to invest in additional lands and additional numbers of slaves to work those lands. So by definition, a cotton plantation is a capitalist enterprise. It's agricultural capitalism as opposed to industrial capitalism, but it's capitalism nonetheless. And what that means is it must expand. If the plantation owner cannot find new lands to cultivate and cannot invest in new slaves to work that land, then his business begins to die. Because managing a plantation, a cotton plantation, is a business. It involves communication and contact with, inter with international commercial interests. It involves contract with, uh, contact with financiers and investors. It requires you to lay your hands on large amounts of capital for purchases of both land and labor. And so consequently, your success as a manager of a plantation requires that you expand, which historically is one of the reasons why the South was so supportive of Andrew Jackson's removal of the Indians west of the Mississippi in what is referred to in history as the Trail of Tears. 
by removing the Cherokees from Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana and making all of that land potentially available to, to cotton plantations Andrew Jackson was expanding the opportunities that capitalism requ requires no less than the same expansion in industrial opportunities in the north but now we've got a problem because obviously free labor must expand but now also slave labor must expand because they are both forms of capitalism and yet the incompatibility of free labor with slave labor means that they cannot expand into the same place wherever slavery goes free labor is excluded if you look at the immigration the numbers of immigration immigrants coming into the United States in the 19th century they are not going into the south they are going into the what is what then was the Northwest Territory into the Illinois and and Wisconsin and Minnesota and Iowa and we have these large populations of Germans and and you know and all of these groups from from Eastern and Western Europe uh, from Eastern Europe these people are in search of opportunity there's no opportunity in their plantation south except for the expansion of slavery itself and so in a sense then the success of southern plantation capitalism inhibits the expansion of industrial capitalism and so consequently Seward can write about what he calls the irrepressible conflict and Lincoln can talk about a nation divided against itself cannot stand a house divided against itself cannot stand we cannot remain half slave and half free we must sometime become all one or all the other that is the traditional approach to the issues of slavery as they relate to capitalism but as I mentioned in his new book entitled Empire of Cotton a Global History Sven Beckert has begun to pull together much of the attention on both capitalism and the attention on slavery and has begin begun to look and to consider the extent to which slavery is not antithetical to capitalism but that in fact slavery was vitally important to the success of capitalism in other words it emphasizes the capitalist nature of plantation management to the point that Beckert is able to make a statement I'm, I'm, I'm trying I'm looking through my notes here for a, a particular statement let me read let me read what Beckert writes when we marshal big arguments about the West's superior economic performance and build these arguments upon an account of the West allegedly superior institutions like private property rights lean government and the rule of law we need to remember that the world Westerners forged 
was equally characterized by exactly the opposite. Vast confiscation of land and labor. Huge state intervention in the form of colonialism. And the rule of violence and coercion. We also, and this I want to return to, at a, you know, if, if time permits today, fine. If not, then some other day. But I want to re- re- refer to this particular statement again. We also need to qualify the fairy tale, he calls it, the fairy tale, that we like to tell about capitalism and free labor. Global capitalism is characterized by a whole variety of labor regimes, one of which, a crucial one, was slavery. Basically, what Sven Beckert has done is integrate the institution of North American slavery, specifically cotton production, into the success of the Industrial Revolution itself. and has pointed out that there's no way to really understand the Industrial Revolution unless you appreciate the contributions that cotton production made to that. And there was no more efficient, productive way to market cotton, to produce cotton, than the slave system. Consequently, the existence of the slave system in the United States actually fuels the Industrial Revolution, fuels the expansion of capitalism. All this myth about free labor and the opportunities of the working man and all of these other things that we're talking about, we talk about come later. Because the irony is they become products of the Industrial Revolution, not the kind of human qualities that fuel it. We like to believe that capitalism developed because of man's internal or innate creativity and drive, motivation. The idea of free people wanting to produce and become productive and being able to be free in order to maneuver and move around and find the most productive outlets for our creativity. We like to believe that that drove capitalism. What Sven Beckert and some of these other studies are beginning to throw put forth is the idea that it was the slave system that fueled this and the free labor system came later. Because of the demand for cotton, cheap cotton, in developing Europe in the 19th century, in the industrializing of Europe in the 19th century, the industrial world became more and more in demand of cotton. And it was the slave system in the South that was able to meet that demand. There was no way in the world that other areas of the world producing cotton under the peasant system, East Asia, Africa, those areas, while they produce cotton, couldn't begin to compete with the mass production of cotton that was coming out of the south, the southern United States. Some numbers. I think these are incredible numbers. In 1800, 25% of the cotton that moved through the port of Liverpool in England, which was the world's most important cotton port, 25% of all the cotton handled in Liverpool came from the United States. 1,800, 25%. 20 years later, 1820, that number had increased from 25% to 
of the cotton that came through Liverpool to 59% coming from the United States. That's 1820. By 1850, 72% of all the cotton consumed in Britain was grown in the United States. Literally, the slave plantation system in the southern United States drove the Industrial Revolution. It fueled it. The ability of the North American plantation system to increase the production of cheap cotton yarn and cloth and meet the growing demands of an industrializing Europe meant that the, that the slave South effectively fueled and, and supported the, industrial, the expansion, the growth of the Industrial Revolution. Here's something else that Becker points out that I think is credibly important, and this is one that I didn't pick up on until I read this. The southern plantation market, the slave market, was so productive that it meant that areas of potential cotton markets in Asia, Africa, and elsewhere around the world did not need to industrialize. They didn't need to industrialize because their cotton needs were being supplied by a Europe which was being fueled by the slave system in the United States. We are talking about the global nature of capitalist development. And that's what makes this study by Beckert and these other pieces of, his, of literature, scholarship coming out during this period, so significant. Let me share with you just a couple of the studies, the most recent studies that have come out. Of course, everybody is familiar with Thomas Piketty's study, which is a, you know, it's reached almost rock star status. The 700-page book full of statistics and tables on capitalism entitled Capital, Capital in the 21st Century. Everybody knows about the popularity of Piketty's book. But here are some others. In the 1930s and 40s, books by, by, by a historian named C.L.R. James and Eric Williams tried to argue for the centrality of capitalism, of, excuse me, of slavery to capitalism, and they got nowhere. In 1974, and this is, the, this is my exposure to it, because this is one of the first books on slavery that I read, was Robert Fogel's study entitled Time on the Cross. And basically what Fogel, who was an economic historian, he and Stanley Engerman, who co-authored the book, Time on the Cross, talked about the profitability of slavery in the United States. There was this myth that the reason slavery ended was because it was not profitable, it was not efficient. And Engerman and Fogel are able to prove beyond the doubt that slavery was extremely efficient and extremely profitable. And that really the Industrial Revolution in the United States, which traditionally has been associated with the mills of New England, really was fueled by the cotton plantations of the South. We are an industrial nation built upon the backs of slaves. Walter Johnson, a young historian, has written a book called River of Dark Dreams, 
Slavery and Empire in the Cotton Kingdom. Harvard University Press, 2013. This is just an indication of some of the presentations. This is one that really caught my fancy. I want to make sure that I that I do it justice. A book entitled Ebony and Ivy, not Ivory, not Ebony and Ivory, the, the, the song, Ebony and Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of America's Universities, a book published in, in, in 2013, two years ago, last year which indicated the extent to which Brown University and Harvard University depended on foundation gifts from people involved heavily in the marketing of, of, of slavery produced cotton. In other words, the slave system was instrumental in the growth and expansion and wealth of, of two of these major institutions, Brown University and Harvard University. Craig Stephen Wilder was the author of Ebony and Ivory, which he published last year. Others studies like this. I mentioned River of Dark Dreams, which is Johnson's book. Here's a book by Kenneth Pomerantz entitled The Great Divergence, China, Europe, and the Making of the Modern World Economy, Princeton University, 2000. Marcel van der Linden's book, Workers of the World, Essays Toward a Global Labor History. Basically what we're seeing is a re-return to the study of capitalism recognizing the extent to which the slave system as it developed in the southern United States contributed to the success and the expansion of the Industrial Revolution. One of the most interesting issues that Beckert introduces here is the idea that Africa, Asia, and other undeveloped parts of the world did not need to industrialize, did not experience the Industrial Revolution because their cotton needs were being met by the productivity coming out of the South prior to the Civil War. I apologize for the, for the phone ringing in the background. I think this is incredibly significant in what economists call the great divergence we begin to see that with the development of the industrial revolution and the success of the industrial revolution there is tremendous increase in the expansion of inequality in the global economy as industrialism continues to proceed the West is able to garner incredible wealth associated with industrialism. But because of the productivity of the southern cotton system, Asia and Africa do not need to industrialize. They remain undeveloped, non-developed areas of the world, principally because of the productivity of the slave South. In 1861, at the, in the, during the first year of the Civil War, the economist spoke, talked about the fact that Union General John C. Fremont 
had emancipated slaves in Missouri. And the economist raised concerns because what it called such a fearful measure, which was the emancipation of slaves, such a fear, fearful measure might spread to other slaveholding states. What if all slaves were emancipated? Quote, inflicting utter ruin and universal desolation on those fertile territories and on the merchants of Boston and New York, quote, whose prosperity has always been derived to a large extent from those territories, unquote. According to Beckert, slavery did not die because it was unproductive or unprofitable. It died because it was so violent, because of the struggles of the slave. And suddenly, non-industrialized areas of the world like Asia and Africa began to come up with an alternative production system to the slave system and that was the production of cotton by peasants the introduction of the free labor system and the organization of free labor as a way to organize and manage the productivity of cotton and it's only when the free labor system successfully begins to replace the slave labor system that the world can accept the end of slavery in the southern United States. This is what Lincoln is confronting as president. This is what the Confederacy believed was the basis of its power the fact that Europe was so dependent on southern cotton. The fact of the matter is, these studies are indicating that the Confederates, Confederacy was absolutely correct. Which makes the diplomacy, the diplomatic success of Abraham Lincoln even more remarkable. Because the Confederates were right. They were banking on their success in seceding from the Union on the dependency of Europe and Germany and some of these other areas on southern cotton. And they were quite right because the southern plantation system was indeed fueling the economic development of the Industrial Revolution. I think it's particularly significant that the lack of industry in Asia and Africa was in part because of the incredible productivity of the southern slave system in the United States. And it's only when the world is able to organize peasant labor and make it productive that the world can afford to see the end of the slave system. Slavery because of the revolts and the violence slavery becomes too expensive it becomes too much of a problem and that's when the the free labor system becomes so appealing and that's when the so-called fairy tale that Becker talks about about the idea that free labor drove capitalism slavery drove capitalism and free labor was was the uh, was the only meaningful workable alternative to the slave system it's an incredible study. Sven Beckert. The title is the 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 author is Sven Beckett, and the title of his book. One more time. I want to make sure that I get this correct. The title of Beckett's book is Empire of Cotton, A Global History, just published by Harvard University by Alfred Knopf. 
We are at the end of our day. It's 59 minutes after the hour. I hope that you have a wonderful week. We'll, be get, we'll get back together again here at the Virtual Center on next Monday. I want to thank you for tuning in. I want to thank you for your support of the Virtual Center and of the Head On Radio Network itself. For Bob Kincaid and his folks at, 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 the, at the Horn, this is Bill O'Brien saying thank you, goodbye, and be safe.